Hello, this is Brian Kilkelly. Welcome to Climate Business Insights. This is for property leaders who want to understand how to adapt and thrive through the massive changes that are taking place this decade as we transition to a net zero economy. It's for business people who want to get ahead, but also want to contribute to fixing our precious planet. Every fortnight, I'm hosting a conversation with a business leader who is driving ambitious transformation goals in their organization. We will talk about where they see climate business opportunities, what are the challenges they're coming up against, what inspires them, and what advice they can offer others on their journey to zero. Today's guest for episode two is Claire Wildfire. Claire is global practice lead for cities at Mark McDonald. And Mark McDonald is a global engineering management and consulting company that's owned by 16,000 employees. We had a great conversation. We talked about engineering, about Claire's passion for understanding how systems are connected together, buildings, infrastructure, and services, and how by understanding that interconnectivity, you can achieve better outcomes for people. We talked about how the future is changing um, dramatically due to climate change and how that's going to change things for business and for people's lives. We also talked about the importance of taking action, despite lacking answers perhaps to many of the unknowns in these challenging times. We also talked about the culture of change uh, based on client need and how those shifts are happening, about the importance of the need to invest in the skills of the future. I think you're going to find this insightful. Please enjoy this episode with my friend, Claire Wildfire. Claire, welcome to the interview. It's great to see you again. Um, really good to have you with us. Thank you, Brian. It's great to see you too. And I'm looking forward to um, the questions and answer session. Awesome. So Claire, just for, um, for people that don't know you so well, it'd be great to kind of um, learn a little bit about you know, your, where, where you've come from, your career history, what you're doing, what your role is, um, what's, what's current things that you're, uh, you're busy with. Okay, um, I think I've had a bit of an unusual career path in that uh, I started with a, a maths degree and then did a short stint at the independent newspaper doing computer graphics. Um, but then um, I was lucky enough to be employed by um, a, a building services engineering company who taught me engineering. And that was a fantastic company called Fulcrum Consulting. And um, it worked on low impact sustainable buildings, even before the word sustainability was really used in our industry. And um, the bit that excited me was um, so not just the buildings themselves and looking at those in a holistic manner, but um, how you can join up the buildings, the bits between the buildings and um, finding ways to uh, improve outcomes by seeing things in this in this holistic manner, exploiting uh, and understanding the interdependencies and the, the synergies, the, the, the sort of virtuous and vicious cycles that e exist um, when you start looking at things in a system. Uh, and moving on then cities is um tends to be where those systems are the most sort of compressed and concentrated versions of the sorts of systems we're talking about in in our industry so um power uh transport uh water buildings and thus the opportunity for most impact so now i have what's almost my dream job, which is global practice leader for cities at Mott McDonald, um, because that involves joining up the best bits of our company, Mott McDonald, to improve the outcomes for cities and their citizens. Wow, that does sound like a dream job. Fantastic. And um, just tell us a bit about Mott McDonald. I mean, uh, as an organisation, maybe you can give us a, a quick description of who they are. Uh, yep. Okay. We are a global um, engineering management and um, international development company. So um, we design the, the systems that, that keep um, the world running if, in effect. So we, uh, we design roads and railways and um, tunnels and the schools and the hospitals um, and also uh, other bits like um, social and economic impacts and environmental impacts. So, and that's not just in the developed world, the global north, we also have the, the international development bit is a lot of work that we do for the aid agencies um, right. in the global south as well. 
Yeah, excellent. And how many how many people are employed at McDonald? Oh, it's um, around sixteen thousand, I think, at the yeah. moment. Wow, so one of the largest practices. Fantastic. And I know Claire that you've been championing um, climate change and zero carbon and decarbonisation agenda. We had the pleasure of working together for a period um, at Climate Kick uh, on climate innovation. Um, I'd love to know, kind of, you know, why is it that you've kind of been championing that as an area and also as a business? Okay, so starting with the business, um, Mott McDonald is employee owned. So it means um, we are a little bit more in control of our destiny, our own destiny than maybe some companies. And that gives us the autonomy to, um, to be able to advise on genuine best outcomes for clients and society. And um, uh, the, the purpose of the company as set by um, the relatively, relatively new executive chair, Mike Haig, is to improve society by considering social outcomes in everything we do and thinking about what that means, um, social outcomes, that's accessibility, inclusion, empowerment, resilience, well-being, um, all of those um, aspects that are about how people live and thinking about uh, the projects that we work on and their impact um, on society. And then climate change is right up there in terms of societal impacts. Um, so, so that's one strand of that. That is therefore something that we take really seriously. But um, in terms of a more direct business case, uh, we see how the future is changing drastically at the moment. So then it makes business sense to be able to understand that from the inside, what it means for us, for our clients, and for our clients' clients, i.e. Um, in, in many cases, that then becomes the citizens and community. So in fact, once you're under the skin of this climate change and net zero challenge, it's not that much of a leap to recognize that our industry holds so many of the cards to success um, in this challenge. We've got knowledge, skills, the ability to solve problems, and also to lead the change to, to do things differently. And when, so taking, thinking about um, net zero um, as a, well, net, net zero and the adaptation and resilience challenge, it isn't just a question of doing the same things, but doing them in a better way, i.e. in a lower carbon way. It's also very clear that we're going to have to do different things. Um, so for example, in net zero, that's electrifying um, a lot of things that traditionally run on oil or gas, like transport and heating systems, um, and even the creation of a new hydrogen economy. But um, then crucially, we also need to understand so for the technical and financial viability of this sort of shift towards renewably generated um, low carbon energy, those changes um, rely on a massive focus on demand reduction as well, making the energy that we have got go further. Um, and so that coming to, back to the business case, that just means there's so much knowledge that we hold in the design of those things that um, will help in moving moving towards the, the 1.5 degree aligned world yeah. so then you also asked about the personal level and i feel really lucky to work for a company and a leader who's made that commitment to be part of that change and and is enabling colleagues and, my, and and me to support these potentially game changing conversations and activities beyond the direct uh, project activity right. um Excellent. And can you tell us a little about you know, what, 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 why, why are you so motivated by that? You know, I'd love to know kind of what, what inspired you to kind of put your time and energy, your career into, uh, into solving some of these challenges as an engineer. I think it's, um, it's an evolution of, it, uh, it, it sounds a bit trite to use the word destiny, but the evolution of the maths brain I've got, which is about solving problems, looking for patterns and solving problems and not being scared by scale and the unknown. So that's what I got taught um, in my career is if you've got a problem to solve, you look for what you know, you look for the patterns and then you work out what else you need to bring in to help solve the problem. And the fact that um, if you've no idea where you're going, you just start chipping away at it until some illuminating sort of understanding comes. So that's one thing. Then that interim company that um, the one I mentioned earlier who taught me how to be an engineer, they also taught me that diversity was good and that not just the, the um, 
standard way of doing things that everybody did because because it's been written in a book but being able to challenge and say why why do you do it like that and the answer because we've always done it that way is not um it, it it's it, it's not something to just say oh all right then i'll continue doing it. so i was always questioning things in a way that sometimes people used to look quite sadly at me and say you know ah you know you've got so much to learn but yeah. but there was value in those challenges that i brought um, and then moving to a really a big company like Mott McDonald, who's got so much breadth and depth of knowledge, I just it, it's such a big playing field. It's a significant company with a voice. Um, and so that evolution of that journey is now I want to use that voice. Right. Wow. Fantastic. And hey, Clay, going back to um, uh, you mentioned about kind of business case uh, mm. and uh, you know, you've, you've been challenging business as usual anyway for, for many years. Um, you know, what, what, would, what would you say is the message or what would, you know, wh why, why is there a business opportunity around this kind of decarbonization and climate transition, uh, especially in terms of property companies and construction industry uh, who seem to be in some ways doing quite well as business as usual uh, and change is coming slowly in that industry. Um, what would you say in terms of what, what, where, where, is, where do you see the opportunities in terms of business opportunities? Um, I think that there are huge drawbacks in the do nothing, the, the continuation of business as usual, because everything is changing around us. Um, so, as I said, the techniques and the things that we're building will will be changing. There's there's no question of that. If um, the the climate change challenge uh, is going to reach, uh, if we're going to reach the, the 1.5 degrees, then we can't continue doing the things that, that we're currently doing. Mm. Um, so it just, it does require people to understand what that new paradigm looks like. Um, and I think you're right, yeah. and getting people to stop and go, you know, actually business as usual is probably the highest risk. Yes, exactly, <laughs> yes. Because at the moment, that's what most people know is, well, this has always worked before, so let's carry on down that line. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think you know, my challenge and all of our challenges is prizing open that moment uh, in mm -hmm. a busy executive's time to just go, just, just stop a second. Hold on. Just, so, just think about this. Yeah. So we've been trialing that. So, so as in we've got a futures toolkit that we've been using externally for... Um, uh for for quite significant clients and i've been doing something that's a, that's similar not exactly the same as that for internal for, for internal business planning okay. and when i've been doing it the 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 you know the leaders i've been doing it with have been saying wow that is such a valuable use of time like you say to slow down to um park your your day job and think about all these things, these existential threats, and how yeah. we're going to deal with them. And how did you get them just to accept that time with you? I think it was um, the combination of the fact that our clients are buying it with, um, within my sphere of influence, a bit of personal brand yeah. that said, I'm looking at all these things, clients are interested, Is should we use some of that internally as well? Oh, okay, okay. So, okay, so clients are buying into kind of the future toolkit. Yep. So, why should you know, yeah. we should be actually using some of our own, yeah. our own medicine? Um, yes, yes, that. exactly. That's what tends to be the case with us, and there's a whole nother sort of conversation around um, Project Thirteen, which I don't know whether you've come across or not, um, but um, what tends to happen is for the really significant projects you're in you're in the discussion because they know you're good at what you do so that's not what you have to persuade your client you have to persuade your client that you understand the wider perspectives the importance of social outcomes of health and safety of, of the climate change and 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 that your um your you know they can trust you you display the right behaviors yeah. and that's the winning um agenda okay. not the being really really good or being really really cheap okay. And, I, and I, I would imagine um, that you'd also recognize that getting the team, getting all the staff, understanding that takes some time. You know, it takes a while for people to kind of 
really understand how to explore and articulate and work with these concepts. Yeah, because they are really busy delivering what you've asked them to do. And uh, there is not a great deal of bandwidth. So um, that whole culture of change and uh, how to bring that to your staff in a non-scary way um, is important. And, and that's where clients asking for it is probably one of the strongest drivers for no, we really do mean that this is important. But that, that's where some of those academies that I mentioned come in, because that's where you need to have the material ready for them to show them that this is what you know now, this is what you need to know in the future. And here's the drip feeding of information where we'll take you from, mm -hmm. you know, from the now to the future. Yeah. Um, because otherwise it must be quite a scary place for employees. Yeah, to... most definitely. Change is coming fast. I can hear you describing the kind of the need, if you like, for the industry to change. What I'd love to kind of dig into a little bit more is um, why, from a business perspective, in terms of um, you know, somebody who's running a company and they're on the board and they're responsible for the profit and loss of that company, um, mm -hmm. is, there, is there an upside to, to moving in this direction? What's the business opportunity, if you like, for that? It is um, about understanding what is going to be different in 10 years time in 20 years time and uh, and the fact that what is the norm now is highly unlikely to be the norm in the future so um, thinking back to um, the, um, the the knowledge that we have now in in my field in designing buildings with gas boilers um, if they're continuing if they'll continue to be gas boilers there'll be hydrogen gas boilers but um, it's highly likely that it'll be some sort of electric heating like heat pumps that's a very different kettle of fish it's not um, a, a sort of mix and match you need to design the buildings differently so all of that means that the the, um, the companies at the forefront who are understanding what that need means in terms of um, shifting skill sets will be ahead of the game as that um, change starts to bite so yeah. As an example, um, in our company, watching the market change away from thermal generation towards renewables, we um, created a renewables academy so that we took the people who were um, hugely knowledgeable on thermal generation and we began to change their skill sets into uh, renewable knowledge because that's the only way that uh, we saw to be able to equip ourselves to, to be able to thrive in in that sort of in the new space with okay. uh, where there's a, a, a seeking of new knowledge okay and do you, do you see a growth in in these new areas happening yes yes so 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 i think that um that's the the point which is the market is changing so mm -hmm. that we could see that coming um that again using that example the the need for more renewables knowledge we saw it coming and it was doing market scanning and watching the time to actually begin to actually make that change um, nice. because otherwise we would have skills in um, an area that we didn't need and we wouldn't have enough skills in an area that was was definitely where the market was heading okay well that's a great message that, you know you've you've read the market you've seen the opportunity and you started scaling up for it yeah brilliant and claire i know that um, McDonald very impressively is one of the few organizations that have actually achieved uh, a net zero in terms of your overall operations, which is a fantastic achievement. So congratulations on that. Um, I'd love to know a little bit about that journey. You know, um, how, how did you how did you manage it? Um, uh, which I know is a, probably a huge long story, but maybe you can give us a quick a quick kind of insight into what that journey has been like. And perhaps, you know, what 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 might become two or three key insights um, for others? who are yeah. embarking on their journey to zero. We have projects in over 150 countries, offices in nearly 50 of them. Our um, global 2019 carbon footprint was um, roughly 30,000 tonnes of CO2 equivalent. So a, a big starting point. And the most important thing probably is that visible leadership from the top for effecting culture change and a need to begin to um, change the the paradigm paradigm but um i think um probably data um is uh, another significant thing so you need it's fairly obvious um you need to see the carbon emission hotspots and be able to track progress but um 
it's important to say that the 80-20 rule applies, as in you don't need the same depth of attention to everything um, because some things, for example, for us, one of the biggest travel related um, footprints was flying. So drilling into that data, we then understood what the issue was um, and were able to consolidate some of the mechanisms where, whereby we were, were tracking um, the, the choice of flying and the, the companies that we were choosing to fly with. So now we do a lot of encouraging of virtual meetings, um, uh, but also signpost low carbon airlines to our staff to try and, and get the, the best um, choice when, um, when our staff are flying. Um, but another thing I think to say is that not all the answers will exist at the time you need them. So you have to be prepared to make assumptions and fill in the gaps later. And somebody once um, mentioned to me that the net zero journey is a bit like sailing to a point on the horizon where you can see your destination, but um, the course includes a lot of tacking so that you won't always um, be pointing directly to where you're going, which, which um, points to the need to have this over, uh, an overall strategy with, that has interim milestones that allow you to sort of track your progress and check that um, you are ticking off um, the points in between, even if um, you, you don't have that um, ability to, to track the, the direction to the, the final result. Yeah. The, there's a few other things like um, the need for independent data verification and, and accreditation. Um, and then the final thing is that carbon neutrality is only a stepping stone to net zero, um, as in um, there's still the need to achieve the, the offsetting. So. The, the plan has to inc include a year on year reduction of actual emissions. And I'm fully expecting the conversation around ethical um, offsetting to explode in the next few years mm -hmm. as we begin to realize quite how crucial um, uh, that, that sort of ever diminishing um, reliance on that sort of net, um, you know, the, the offsetting bit of the equation yeah. um, arises. Yeah, very true. And uh, it's been very interesting to see the debate around um, double counting of offsetting. Um, so it's, yeah, it's incredibly complex and difficult. Uh, kind of on the journey you're on, what, what, what's next, Claire, for you? What's kind of, a, what, what's coming up? What, what challenges? Because um, I know you're, um, you're involved in some cross-industry work as well. Um, I mean, it might, might be great for people to hear a little about what you're doing there as well. Um, so yeah. I'm involved in is the UK Net Zero Infrastructure Industry Coalition that we founded in 2019 when we knew that in the UK the, the Climate Change Committee report was coming out um, because we firmly saw that um, our industry holds uh, so much of the knowledge that we need to, to actually successfully get to that um, net zero point that the UK's um, sort of set as mandatory by 2050 because um, we've got uh, as I said earlier we've got the, the knowledge and the ability to solve problems so the um, net zero infrastructure industry coalition is a is a coalition of progressive um, industry players that have come together to create knowledge um, we've got several reports released already one is on the sequencing of actions towards um, decarbonization of heat um, looking at both the knowledge from the supply side and the demand side actors. There's another one on the embodied carbon of the UK's infrastructure pipeline, um, which is interesting. And then one that's really close to my heart that um, uh, is a sort of a springboard for um, a lot more conversations is one that's called pla the place-based approach to net zero. And there's a challenge there um, in that um, a lot of the answers to how to set us on this journey sit at the, the city scale, as in the, the interim scale between um, uh, maybe citizens themselves and national scale, um, where cities have, um, have the insight and the power to enable conversations that aren't otherwise visible um, at national scale. So enable to uh, uh, harness sort of local, um, local investment, um, the ability to help citizens see that there's, um, you know, that there's long term gain, even if there may be short term pain. And um, so that conversation about helping cities see how they can uh, make the most of 
the opportunities that sit with them and mobilize um, some of that movement. Um, you know, who, who else, Claire, do you think would be interesting to kind of hear from on this topic? Um, always love to kind of hear ideas and others we could uh, interview to kind of really delve into these into this kind of question about the business opportunities around climate change. So um, I don't have an actual name, but one thing that is interesting me is um, the, the companies that I've heard of that are setting internal carbon levies. Um, and I saw an article that mentioned that British land in doing that and also linking its employee bonuses to embodied carbon figures has actually achieved um, a shift in um, that their projects, there's uh, more of a preference now for refurbishment over demolition, i.e. something that the industry has been trying to um, uh, align with and make happen, or those passionate people like me in the industry have been sort of um, prodding that debate for ages, and things like um, the these internal carbon levies and bringing carbon even in a um, an internal way into the decision making within companies um, seems like a really powerful tool to begin to uh, make that change happen faster. So Fantastic. I would recommend finding somebody who can give you insight into that. Good. Well, I know just the person, so that's very helpful. <laughs> so we'll have, to get, uh, we'll have to get Juliet Morgan, if you're listening, I'll be coming after you soon. Um, so yeah, great. Thanks, Claire. And um, look, thanks so, so much for all that you've shared on, on this interview. Um, some real, real nuggets in there. And I, I'd just like to commend you um, for all the work you're doing and also Mark McDonald's. Um, great organisation, and I think the work you're doing is is really crucial. Uh, and I'm just wondering, Claire, how if people want to kind of um, connect with you after listening to this, where might they find you? What's the best way of connecting with you? Um, LinkedIn uh, is uh, definitely a good place. Um, and just finally, you know, people that are listening to this are from lots of different businesses. Um, that we are focusing initially on construction and property, but there'll be people listening from different kinds of enterprises. Um, and you know, these are people listening because they are interested in being better prepared for the future uh, and they want to lead their business as well and do good work. Uh, what, what kind of one last final piece of advice might you give um, somebody who's kind of coming at that, that mindset? What, 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 would you, what would you suggest advice for them? I've got two, but they're both quite short. Okay. Um, so one thing I would say is that scenario planning and foresighting tools are incredibly useful to help explore the unknowns and and set um, what what I think has become known as the least regrets path because they illustrate the drawbacks of the do nothing scenario um, and therefore help us see um, our role in shaping the preferred versions of the futures, the ones that are aligned with um, a, a 1.5 degree future. Yes. So. Um, and they can even be used to show citizens and communities why those actions are being taken. Right. So, so that's that. That's one thing. Mm. Um, the other is don't wait for somebody else to be the first. And that's sort of even if some people are looking at you a bit oddly at the time when you say something. Um, and that's because your questions prompted me to look back at my career and just had this observation that so many ideas and suggestions that seemed outlandish at um, the time are now in play. And I so wish we'd been able to move faster with some of those things. Right, right. Fantastic. That's really, really good advice. Scenario planning. Don't wait. Get going. Really helpful. Um, Claire, thank you so much. It's been great chatting to you. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks. Bye.